I'd like to introduce Dr. Dan Wallach from Rice University. Dan is the Associate Director of the National Science Foundation's ACCURATE, which stands for a Center for Correct, Usable, Reliable, Auditable, and Transparent Elections. He does work at UC Berkeley and Princeton, and his research involves computer security, looking at various things from web browsers to peer-to-peer -peer systems to voting machines and smartphones. And he's testified about voting security before uh, government bodies in the United States, Mexico, and the EU, and he's been an expert witness in several cases about voting technologies. And today he's going to talk to us about StarVote. And please help me in welcoming Dr. Dan Wallach. Thank you very much. Um, so the order of the speakers here is a little bit upside down because later this afternoon you're going to be hearing from Avi Rubin and from Alex Halderman who will be telling you about all the things that make voting hard and all the ways that present systems are broken. And that would have been a great introduction to what I'm doing now. But anyway, today I'm going to be telling you about a system that is a design, it's a work in progress. The system is called StarVote, which just like ACCURATE is another complicated acronym, secure, transparent, auditable, reliable. Anyway, it's a voting system that we're designing. But this is a rare thing because we're designing it with an election official in the loop. So at uh, EVT Vote, which is one of the big conferences where voting uh, security people go to talk, Dana de Beauvoir, county clerk for Travis County in Austin, Texas, came and told us, we want to do a brand new voting machine and we want your help, she says to a bunch of computer geeks in the audience. That's a pretty crazy thing. That doesn't happen all the time. So let me tell you a little bit about Austin. Travis County has roughly a million people who live there. You know, not quite 400,000 voted in the previous presidential election. That gives you a sense of the size of the population. Um, every state does voting differently. In Texas, we have two weeks of early voting. Any voter can go to any of 23 locations in Travis County to, to, to vote. Travis County is also doing a new thing called election day vote centers, which means any voter can go to any precinct anywhere and get his or her correct ballot and vote. And if you think about that, that introduces all sorts of interesting complexities. And this is more for the benefit of the Europeans who can't comprehend the notion of an election with so many questions. When you want to have 100 plus different questions on the ballot, things get more complicated from a human factors perspective. So our goal is to build a system that is both secure and all that, but it has to be usable. And that the usability constraint plus all these other things really informs the design. So before 2001, Travis County used centrally tabulated optical scan ballots. That means people filled in a bubble, it went into a dumb metal box, and then they set up an operation in like a, in like a, a football stadium kind of thing, where just huge logistical challenges to scan and tabulate the ballots and get a total that evening. Um, for the past decade, they've been using a, an electronic, so-called DRE, direct recording electronic voting machine, this tech, so there's a photo of it on the screen. You can see that, okay, why did they buy this thing? Why did they spend all the money? Well, you know, they said, oh, it makes it easy to tabulate. It resolves voter ambiguity because voters are people and people are ambiguous. You know, rather than having weird marks on paper, they just have, all that ambiguity is resolved before the voter leaves the booth. Everybody loved it except for a bunch of crazy activists like me who said, this is totally not secure. I don't trust it. It's not reliable, et cetera. Um, and I was part of a team for the state of California in 2007 that analyzed this very voting machine and found a large stack of significant security vulnerabilities. That would be another hour-long talk. I'll save that for bug me later if you really want to see the pretty animations of just how bad this machine is from a security perspective. But anyway, starting in 2011, Travis County came to this realization, wow, we need to, we've had these machines a decade, they're wearing out, it's time to buy something new. What do we want to buy? Wow, there's nothing really good on the market. So let's call those crazy academics and see if they want to help us. Our first meeting was just about a year ago, and our second meeting will be this weekend. So I'm flying back to Houston on Friday and driving to Austin on Saturday morning. Um, to give you a sense of just how rare this opportunity is, Olivier Perea, who's Belgian, flew in on his own dime. He's like, wow, I can't miss this opportunity. You know, um, Josh Benelow from Microsoft was so excited that he took vacation time from Microsoft to fly down. This, 
This is a really rare opportunity for academics to work with an actual election official to design something right from the get-go. So, design is no fun if your hands aren't tied behind your back. Constraint number one, they said it shall have a direct recording electronic user interface. That means that every voter gets the same UI. We have all the nice accessibility features. Voter intent is disambiguated before they leave the polls. That was just a requirement handed down. Handmarked paper was not acceptable. That was just a constraint we had to live with. Um, they, and they really wanted to use off-the-shelf hardware. When you go to Hard Inner Civic or Diebold or whatever Diebold is called these days and say, I'd like to buy an electronic voting machine, they say, great, that'll be $3,000 a piece for what amounts to a crappy old computer. Now, for contrast, a, a brand new state-of-the-art Sony Vio Tap 20-inch touchscreen Windows 8 tablet thing is a thousand bucks, more or less. So we want to be able to run on this kind of off-the-shelf hardware. So custom, custom software off-the-shelf hardware, that's a goal to keep costs down. And we do want to have a printer. We want to have a printed record of the voter intent, so that way no matter what goes wrong with the computer, there are still these tangible artifacts. So what's that going to look like? So here's a mock-up that, uh, that the Travis County Elections Office put together. What you don't see is a list of all the candidates. You only see a list of the choices made by the voter. And when you're talking about 100 different choices, that means you can now compress everything the voter wanted to vote for onto a single sheet of paper. That's a big deal from a managing large piles of paper perspective. Um, likewise, we're using the OCR font to make it easier to scan and read it mechanically. Constraint number three, we have to support this election day vote center business that any voter can go to any precinct and get his or her correct ballot. There are thousands of different ballot styles in a place like Travis County, and it's even worse in bigger places. So what that means is we need to have online access to a centralized voter registration database. That way you can't go vote early and often, much as you might want to. But the voting machines themselves, we need to be able to operate in an offline fashion which means that we have to have information flowing from the internet, like your name, like this is the correct ballot style for Dan Wallach. That ballot style identifier needs to somehow flow across the boundary in a way that's secure and controlled. Constraint number four, even if we lose power, the election has to still go. So that means we need to be able to run the whole damn election on battery for at least 12 hours. If you think about it, that's a huge issue for any kind of printer. I mean, inkjet can support the battery budget, but inkjet is not reliable. Inkjet is just the too failure prone. Anybody have an inkjet printer they hate? Yeah, inkjet is not going to cut it. Laser printers take way too much power. We're talking about, you know, two to three kilowatts to warm up the drum. We can't afford that on battery power. The only choice left is thermal. That's where you get all your restaurant receipts. All the consumables are in the paper. They're low power, they're reliable, but thermal, ew, right? Well, it's the only choice that fits, I'm sorry. And now, when you say I want to have a touchscreen computer with a long battery life, your choices are laptops, tablets, or the occasional big tablet, like that Sony Vio thing. The Sony Vio thing can do four hours on its battery, which is not bad. I'd like to get 12. To get 12, I'm now looking at, like, 10 to 12 inch touchscreen laptops, maybe I'm willing to go for the 20 inch screen and the shorter battery life. That might be an acceptable trade off. Um, just FYI, I did a battery rundown test on the Sony and I got four hours with the screen on the whole time. So maybe I'm willing to let the screen go dark when there's no voter there. Maybe then I can get more time. All right, so those are the constraints. Let me give you some goals now. I want to, so I worked on an earlier voting system project called VoteBox, which networked the vote, voting machines together. So every vote is copied to every machine because storage is cheap. So we have massive super duper redundancy. Now this is not the internet, this is a local LAN in the polling place. And I'll tell you more about some of the hash chaining issues later, but suffice to say that we want to make it incredibly difficult to tamper with history using some cryptographic techniques. Likewise, we want to use some sophisticated end-to-end -end cryptography. You heard about some of that earlier from Alan. We want to, we're going to be doing homomorphic verifiable tallies, just like you heard about earlier. And there will be a public bulletin board that anybody can go to and see all the votes all in one place, and anybody can verify the, the official tallies. We're also going to use some statistical techniques, what are called risk-limiting audits, 
where we will be statistically comparing the paper to the electronic re records to make sure that they match up. If there's any discrepancy, that's bad. And usability matters. Everything that we engineer, everything we do, had better be usable by, by the full spectrum of the general population, age, income, ability, you name it. If we require a security feature that damages usability, then we lose. So we had two, two usability guys on the, on the committee with us, keeping us honest. Let me tell you, it's brutal. So let me give you the, rather than walking you through how we came to the design, let me just present you the final design and show you how it works. So here's a registration desk. This is where you walk up and say, hi, I'm Dan Wallach, and this is connected to the internet, you know, off the edge of your screen. The, the internet is over here. Ooh. Anyway, um, the registration the voter walks up, and the voter says, all right, I'm Dan Wallach. Here's my ID card, if that's required in your state. And then it is handed some sort of a printout that says, you are precinct 101A. All this does is identify the correct ballot style. This is printed on ye old receipt printer like you get from, your, from a restaurant. Then the voter carries that over to a controller that's responsible for all these voting machines. The controller is the, is the machine that the uh, election official is sitting at. It keeps track of the, the state of the machines. It can say, hey, wait a minute, that machine got unplugged. Go plug it back in, all on the network. Anyway, the voter brings this over. It gets scanned, and then they're given a new printout. The new printout has a four or five digit authorization code. It's a nonce. It's a, basically a random number that nobody else has gotten before. And it's valid just long enough to get the voter over to some machine. The voter punches the number in, and now they get the correct ballot style presented to them. This is more or less how Hard Inner Civic does it. The nice part about this is the, the things that are moving back and forth are transparent. The voter can look at this, and there's no hanky-panky. There's nothing weird about this piece of paper. Anyway. The voter specifies who they want to vote for, they pick their choices, and then when they're done, out comes from the voting machine a printout, as I showed you earlier, that lists all of their choices. Then, and here's the thing that, that's sort of crazy, the voter goes and takes this piece of paper and drops it into a ballot box. Imagine that. So a traditional classical ballot box, but we also have copies of the votes stored on all these machines. So, and in fact, the ballot box itself is connected to the network. So that means that everybody else knows that that ballot went into the ballot box. So we have a connection between all the different events in the system. They're all tied together. Um, as it turns out, the ballot has a random ID number on it, but we don't want to let that be... We, we encrypt that before it goes on the network because we don't want to have a record of the ballots in the order that they're cast on the network. We only, want, we only want encrypted stuff on the network for reasons I'll get into later. But here's the, but never mind all that. The usability of this system is the key thing. Let's say the voter is walking from the voting machine over to the ballot box. They're reading this piece of paper and they say, whoops, that's not who I wanted for president. I made a mistake. Now the voter can spoil this ballot and say that this is, this is wrong. And then they can put, take a big red stamp and go invalid. And then that doesn't go into the box. The voter can take it home if they want. It doesn't matter. And the, of course, the, the, the ballot doesn't go into the ballot box. And the ballot box will notice that. Everybody else will notice that this ballot didn't go in. So even though there's an electronic record that this ballot was created, there's, there is no corresponding record that it was cast. So we know not to tabulate it at the end. All right. So now I'm going to start talking about different threats to the system and how our architecture, how our design, mitigates those threats. Right? This is an exercise you should go through if you're designing any system for any security purpose. You need to say, how might an attacker try to compromise me and what am I going to do about it? So I'm using little red horns to imply that there's some tampered or evil software here. Everybody get the notation? Pretty sophisticated. So what if we have an evil voting machine that just tries to invent votes out of whole cloth. Uh, oh, here's a vote, here's another vote, here's another vote. Millions of votes per second, whee! Well, if in that kind of an attack, there will be no matching authorization message. There's no message produced by the controller that says, hey, here's an authorization code for a ballot style. 
which means that when you do the, when you, when you look at the electronic records later, you'll see this stuff is, is forged. The, 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 there's no corresponding records to which it, it could possibly correlate. And likewise, there's no paper either, which means that you can very clearly identify those millions of forged, uh, millions of forged ballots as being forged. But now what if you're working in cahoots with the controller? I authorize a vote, I cast a vote, I authorize a vote, I cast a vote, Waha. So now you have consistent electronic records, but you still have inconsistencies with the paper. So an audit that compares the paper to the electronic will find the discrepancy. Um, and if, if, those, if, if, the, if they try to carry on this conversation with each other, the, the two evil machines, without letting anybody else in on it, then you'll have inconsistent electronic records that could also be caught. So, now you might also ask, well, how is somebody going to arrange for these two machines to be evil? One of the, th there's a problem in, in all voting systems called the sleepover problem, which is where was your voting machine the night before the election? In many cases, the answer is in somebody's trunk of their car. That's kind of unacceptable, but that's just how it's done. So now we can at least arrange for these different machines to take different routes through different poll workers' car trunks, and hopefully that, that physical diversity also helps mitigate against the risk of multiple machines being tampered with in a, in a, in a collaborating fashion. So what about traditional paper ballot box stuffing? I said it's a, this is a basic ballot box. All it has is a scanner on top to look for the ballot going in and says, yup, I saw it. Well, could somebody shove a lot of stuff into the box? In that case, we now have the opposite. Rather than having a bunch of electronic ballots without corresponding paper, instead we have a lot of paper ballots without corresponding electronic records. In that case, once again, when we do the post-election comparison of this, we'll say the, there are, there's more paper here than there should be. Something is clearly wrong. Now, there's a, a particular nasty attack against voting called chain voting. The way this works in a traditional polling place is you walk up to the polling place, there's a shadowy character outside, opens his trench coat and says, here's a ballot, I want you to vote this one. And then you bring me back your blank and I'll pay you $10. Okay, that's chain voting. So in, this, in star vote, how do we deal with chain voting? Well, because everything is time stamped, we would see that there's this, you know, I mean, at least in a typical vote center, we might, you might be waiting half an hour to vote, so we'll see that half hour difference. We'll see that, you're, that you filled out the vote on the machine at you know, one o'clock and you didn't cast it until 1.30. That's, that's immediately suspicious, because it doesn't take half an hour to walk from this side of the room to that side of the room and put it in a box. So these kinds of timestamps, again, help, they don't defeat the threat, but they help mitigate it. They make it easier to detect. Okay, what if we have a malicious machine now that rather than trying to compromise the votes, is simply trying to remember how you voted? If I can remember th the votes in plain text in the order that they're cast, and there's likewise a cryptographic trick called subliminal channels where I might try to monkey with the randomness in my crypto system in order to achieve the same effect, that I can leak information. This is a deep problem. And none of the crypto schemes that anybody has ever imagined solve this problem. So instead we have to look outside of the crypto literature at the how do I trust that my computer is running the correct software literature. So that gets us into a, a world called trusted platform management or measurement. The M seems to change its value depending on who you talk to. So TPM technologies are the very same things that you hear people grumbling about. How come I can't boot Linux on my new Windows box? because of this UEFI garbage. You've heard people grousing about that, right? Finally, a use for it. Now you can't install your malware on a lockdown voting machine because it'll refuse to boot. So I don't necessarily agree that, you, that this technology is good for a consumer laptop or a consumer desktop, but I think it's great for a voting machine. So we can piggyback on, on that existing technology. Again, it's a mitigation. It doesn't solve the problem, but it makes it a lot harder for an attacker to tamper with the software. Um, what if our malicious machine now was trying to compromise, like let's say the voter votes Alice for president and it tries to record a vote for Bob. How are we gonna catch that? Well, we could catch it with a post-election audit where we compare the paper to the electronic, but we're also gonna do a nifty trick from Josh Benelow 
where we can challenge the machine. More on that in just a minute when I get into the crypto. Lastly, what if the ballot box is just knocked offline? So now we don't have the acknowledgments coming back. Well, first off, this is a condition that is observable. The controller, because it's connected to the same network as the ballot box, will say, whoa, I lost the ballot box, I don't see it. So, and even in the worst case where the ballot box's network just fails, nonetheless, this is something we could resolve post-election. So now we know something went wrong and we're gonna do audits to try to compare the electronic and paper ballots. So, let me walk you through this Benelow challenge mechanism. This is from 2006, 2007 or so. And I think it's one of the fundamental ways of making a voting machine convince you that it's operating correctly in your interests. So we have a regular user interface experience where the voter makes all their selections and says Alice for president, Bob for Senate, whatever. And then when they're done, the machine has to somehow commit. In a cryptographic sense, it has to commit to the, to the, to the, to the final ballot in a way that it can't take it back. I'll show you how we do that in a second. Then the voter is given some kind of a choice. Do you want to cast this ballot or challenge the ballot? If you cast the ballot, it's confirmed, it's done, it's easy. If it's challenged, then the machine has to provide you enough you know, crypto material for you to be able to decrypt the very ballot that was just cast. And that would mean that if the machine produced bogus ciphertext, it would be caught in the process. So how do you realize a Benelow challenge? The original idea was that it would print the ciphertext behind an opaque plate. You would see the printer go, you'd see the paper coming up, but it's behind a plate, you can't see the ciphertext. Nonetheless, the machine cannot unprint it once it's printed. All right, that's all well and good. Um, then the voter says cast or challenge, there's some kind of a user dialogue. And then it, 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 if, it, if you say challenge, it prints the, the, the decryption stuff below, and now you've got this independently verifiable piece of paper that has the encrypted ballot and the verification codes. And if that comes out bogus, you've caught the machine red-handed lying to you. Helios, which we heard about earlier, does this by sending the hash as part of the web page interaction. Votebox, the system that, we, that we, we did the same time as Helios, we published the ciphertext on the local area network, which made, the machine can't take it back once it's published it. All of these prior systems rely on asking the voter this one extra question, which creates a significant usability problem. How so? The, the, the usability people call this a post-completion error which most commonly manifests in old crappy ATMs. When you put your card in, you say, I would like $200 done, it gives you the money, and you didn't take your card back, but you've got your money, so you leave. And you leave your card in the machine. Anybody ever seen a machine like this? The older ones, all, the original first-gen ATMs all had this problem. Then they first tried to fix it by beeping at you, beep, beep, get your card, beep, beep. Then they quickly realized that was stupid and they, now the new ATMs all make you take your card before they give you the money. Get it? So we need to avoid a comparable error. Hey, I'm done voting. What, one more question, what are you talking about? So the way that we solve this in star vote is that, so we're still doing the vote box style broadcast the ciphertext out to the network, but now the challenge is simply do you put the ballot in the ballot box or not? That's it. So if you choose not to put it in the ballot box, you know, we're, you're allowed to spoil your ballot, we'll put a big red stamp on it, and you can take it home. And then you'll be able to look on the bulletin board and find the corresponding ciphertext at the end of the day, along with the ability to decrypt it. So that means that you can verify this, I mean, not real time, but at the end of the day. And I'll tell you a little bit later how the digital signatures work. You have enough proof that the machine did what it did that Again, if the machine tried to lie and generate ciphertext that didn't correspond to the voter intent, you've caught it. All without needing to impact the user experience, which is a big win. And oh, by the way, this enables what we call live parallel testing. Now we can have roving people who go from place to place and do test votes. And they might be working for the county, they might be working for the political parties. And do what you want, bring your video cameras, bring your witnesses, do anything you want. You just, are, you just can't put the result into the voting machine, into the ballot box. But you can still take it home, and that means that you can test, you can do, rather than traditional parallel testing where you pull machines out at the beginning of the day and run a fake election on them, 
now real machines in the field can be tested live. And if anything goes wrong, you, you've caught the real machine in the act of cheating. So how's that post-election verification going to work? We'll add a new piece that you can tear off and take home with you. It has a URL, it has a QR code. So that means that this helps the voter to find the ciphertext on this public bulletin board. So there's a, there's a, there's a wonderful, subtle little attack with these cryptographic voting, voting schemes that I should tell you about. So imagine that here's what we tell the voter. If the ciphertext ends in an even number, you should cast the ballot. If the ciphertext ends in an odd number, you should challenge the ballot. The wonder of this kind of an attack is that it takes this Benelo challenge and turns it on its head. And now the voter is the one who might be challenged. And the voter, if they don't vote the way they're being bribed to vote or coerced to vote properly, now the voter gets caught red-handed, right? So we don't have a, per the way we can mitigate this attack and not completely defeat it, mind you, but mitigate it, is first off, the voter can cast and spoil lots of different ballots. So that way they can certainly produce one thing that will satisfy what they're, what they're being coerced or bribed to do. We could, be we could do stronger things, like I could get rid of that URL and just have the QR code, and most voters, especially older ones whose eyes are failing, can't figure out whether some bit is black or white on that QR code. The problem with this is that now I'm trading security for usability, and that's a trade-off that the usability people insist on winning, and I think I agree with them. So it's unclear whether this is a significant attack, but we can at least mitigate it partially. Right, so in the interests of time, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the crypto, but I'm gonna give you a general sense of how we've structured a lot of the crypto. Um, every machine has a public key, a separate public key, and in fact, the election official is basically a, cer a certifying authority, a certificate authority. So all the machines can speak to each other. We can even bring a machine in, like let's say that we have a machine that blows up, so I phone home and I say, I need a new machine, help. And so a new machine that was not configured for this poll can show up, be plugged in, and because it's part of the, because it has a key that was certified by a trusted authority that all the machines trust, it can jump right in and, and join the protocol. Um, every single message that's sent between any of these machines on the network is signed, broadcast, and logged. The three of these mean, create a very interesting structure. Because of the signatures, we can immediately reject any message that isn't part of the official network. If somebody just jacks in you know, some little tiny computer and starts broadcasting messages, we can totally ignore it because it's not, doesn't, it's not part of the, the, cert the certifying authority. Um, because every message is broadcast, I mean every message is broadcast, then we have, if there are n voting machines, we have n copies of the entire day's network traffic which gives us a huge amount of ability to go back forensically to ask what happened during the day. And everything is logged and the log is hashed. So what that means is if you can somehow tamper with a machine at three o'clock, you can't tamper with the history before three o'clock because lots of people have hashes that cover that history in the past. You can at best tamper with the future. Every ballot is encrypted with this exponential Elgamal stuff, and I could run you through all the math, but suffice to say that it looks a lot like a Diffie-Hellman kind of exponentiation, and in, you can take any two ballots and you more or less multiply them together, and you get the equivalent of adding, of decrypting, adding, and re-encrypting, all without needing the decryption keys. So what that means is that anybody can accumulate ballots, only the election official can decrypt them at the end of the day, and we're gonna use some threshold key sharing techniques to make sure that an evil election official cannot act unilaterally to decrypt an election total. It takes a committee of trustees, and you can pick any K of N you want, and those you know, K and N are numbers you dial in when you construct the election. So the trustees might be the Democratic Party chairman, the Republican Party chairman, the newspaper editor, League of Women Voters president, et cetera. And so you pick any K of N subset of that can then collaborate to decrypt the election totals. Um, homomorphic tallying and write-in votes 
don't fit together quite well. It's kind of, it's, there, there's an oil and water problem, but there are some standard kludges to deal with it, and so we deal with it. Um, also, every counter, I mean, a ballot is just a collection of numbers, zero or one, and we'd like to know that there's no counter that says a million votes for Alice. That would be bad. So there's a standard trick called a non-interactive zero knowledge proof, which where you can produce this mathematical statement that with incredibly high probability proves that this number that I encrypted is either zero or one, but you can't tell which. So we can use tricks like that. You put all these together, and now you've got a pretty robust system. Let me tell you a little bit more about the thing the voter can take. Every voter gets to walk home with this if they want. So it hashes, okay, the actual ciphertext of the ballot is too big to put in a QR code. The biggest QR code you can get is about 5,000 bits. So an actual encrypted ballot could be hundreds of thousands of bits. But we can put, we can hash that, and for that matter, we can hash we can include the hash of the prior log in the voting machine. We can include the machine ID, date and time of vote cast, and then we can digital, digitally sign the whole mess. All of that can fit into a QR code, which means that the voter walks out with this complicated cryptographic contraption that, that allows them a huge amount of verifiability into what happened during the day in that polling place by looking at the public bulletin board later. Um, Let's see, skip that, oh yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about how the voter might verify this thing. So the simple thing that a voter might do is simply visit that URL. The QR code expands to a URL, and then they visit it, and it says, yup, here it is. Now that might not sound very satisfying, right? That, could, that sounds spoofable, but we can certainly also provide an open source tool or for that matter, specs for you to build your own, and then you can scan the QR code with that tool. And again, the QR code is just a URL that has all these fields, and the tool can tear them apart and then go visit the public bulletin board on its own and download stuff in JSON format or whatever floats your boat. Now, most voters are not software engineers. Most voters are not even understanding of what it means to download and compile and install an open source project product. That's not going to fly for most voters. What will fly is that the League of Women Voters or the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or the local newspaper could provide an app for that. So you could install the Democratic Party's app on your phone or the Republican Party's app on your phone, and that app can scan the QR code and then send it to the local party. And then the party now gets thousands or tens of thousands of these things coming in that help them verify what happened. And they can have a sophisticated cryptographer on staff. Or they can at least borrow one to help them build this tool. So what can, what can we verify? We can verify that the for, the, for the challenged ballots, we can verify that the plain text corresponds to the ciphertexts. Anybody can verify that the homomorphic tallying works. Anybody can verify the hash chains. We have tons of ability to verify that everything worked correctly. But what if something didn't verify? What if something went wrong? What if the total that comes out of the homomorphic thing is some ridiculous number? You know, like. We have five quadrillion votes for this candidate. Well, there aren't that many voters, right? Something went wrong. Well, what are we supposed to do? So this is where we leave the cryptographic stage and now talk about a statistical sampling process. Um, SOBA, I forget what it stands for, is a process that was originally invented for dealing with optical scanned paper ballots. The, the idea of this process is that we want to verify not that the paper ballots exactly correspond to the electronic tallies. That's too difficult. Instead, we want to know that the paper ballots are close enough that any possible error in the paper wouldn't be enough to throw the outcome. So we're, we're considering the paper ballots to be primary records of the election, and we're considering the electronic scans of the paper to be secondary, 
We want to make sure that they are close, statistically likely to be close enough with high confidence that the election outcome won't change. So that means that in practice you end up looking at you know, somewhere between 50 and 100 ballots, maybe. As the election gets closer, you have to look at more and more ballots. But as the, margin, as the election gets broader, you have to look at relatively few ballots to convince yourself with high, with high probability, with high confidence that the election outcome will stand. Now, this does require decrypting individual ballots, which is something that homomorphic tallying is kind of all about not doing. So for this process, we implement a mixnet, we re-encrypt it with a whole different set of keys for auditors to be able to decrypt it, and then the auditors have to be trusted to throw away all that data later. But the auditors actually will only decrypt the 50 or 100 ballots they need for the audit. They won't decrypt everything. And again, they use this threshold stuff so one evil auditor can't just decrypt the whole election and see how everybody voted. And I should point out that homomorphic tallying enables all kinds of fun auditing. You can, basically anything you want to get a subtotal of, I can give you a decrypted verifiable subtotal. So precinct level subtotals, no problem. You know, random samples of precincts, no problem. So that, that w there's a lot of opportunity to invent new kinds of auditing that would fit into this system. Status, the, the, I had a bunch of students working for me years ago building VoteBox, it still works. We're sort of mutating VoteBox to look like StarVote, that almost works. And I'm gonna have some students working for me this summer to make it really work. Um, you wouldn't wanna use undergraduate written flaky code in a production voting system. So instead what I expect is this will be a proof of concept and that we will instead hire professionals. Um, we're in the process of putting together a request for proposals, which is a fancy government way of saying, hey, what will you charge us to build this thing that we want? That process is, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll hit the streets soon. But let me, tell, let, let me take off my technical hat and put on a legal hat. How on earth are we gonna certify this voting system? This is a really interesting challenge because this isn't like anything else. The regular certification process doesn't know what to do with a thing like this. Like, for example, what's the ballot? Laws, have, there are all sorts of legal things that talk about the ballot. We don't have a the ballot. We have lots of copies that all speak to voter intent. And no one is better than any other. For certain attack models, the electronic ballots, the electronic records might be better than the paper records. For other attack models, the paper records might be better than the electronic records. For that matter, what is a recount? What does the word recount even mean when we're providing all this public evidence for anybody to tally anything? So you know, in, in, in my mind, the way we solve these problems is that we don't talk about ballots anymore, we talk about records of voter intent. And we, and we talk about better and worse records of voter intent. Likewise, we don't talk about recounts, we talk about ways of spending more effort to get a more accurate answer. So maybe we'll do a risk limiting audit with a tighter confidence interval. I mean, there's lots of things that we can imagine doing during a recount that, are, that don't involve people counting things by hand. I, went, I, I was an observer at a recount in Harris County where I live, Houston, Texas where they printed ballots from the computer and had people counting them by hand, and sure enough, they came out equal to what the computer added them up as. Huzzah, right? This is not a useful process. This is a whole lot of people spending a Saturday afternoon where they could have done something better with their time. So let me tell you about some other things about, oh my God, I never thought that voting could be so ugly in real life. So there's a, there's a thing called provisional voting. You show up and you say, hi, I'm Dan Wallach, I'd like to vote. And they're like, we don't have you on the poll books. And you say, no, I should be on the poll books. You're, you're, you're wrong. And they say, oh, fine. But they don't just say, go ahead and vote. You vote provisionally. So you have an envelope where you write on the outside of the envelope, my name is Dan Wallach, I should have been allowed to vote. Here's where I live, here's why you're wrong, blah, blah, blah. And inside the envelope goes your paper ballot. Then there's a process at the end of the election where a, a series of election judges or officials sits around a table and says, Dan Wallach, he claims he should have been allowed to vote. What up? And then they figure out, oh, sure enough, we lost the voter registration card. He did send it in. It was under a chair. Who knew? 
or they say, oh, he's crazy, you know, he lives in a different county, he's wrong. That process happens by looking at the outside of the envelope. Then if they agree to, to accept the provisional ballot, the ballot comes out of the envelope and back into the stack, preserving anonymity. We need to support something like that. So we can, the way we do it is that we have the regular star vote process, the ballot, the printed ballot goes into an envelope rather than in the ballot box, and we just need a special way of saying, this wasn't a challenge ballot, we don't want to decrypt it at the end of the day, this one is in limbo. So we have th really three states for a, cast ba for a ballot. Either cast it's in the box, it's not in the box and we want to decrypt it later, or it's not in the box and we don't want to decrypt it later. So we have to have enough records to keep track of that. Otherwise it fits right in. There's also a goofy thing that you've never heard of called limited ballots. So this happens in the corner case where after the end of voter registration period, you've moved to an adjacent county or something and you haven't been able to re-register to vote, but you still want to vote, but you can't vote in your old polling place because you moved, and your new polling place you're not registered because you can't have been. Ah, this corner case happens. This is a real problem. And the solution, at least in Texas law, is that you get a ballot with the intersection of the new location and the old location. So whatever candidates are in common, you're allowed to vote for at the new location. So we have to support that too. Ugh. Mostly that's a UI problem for the controller. And then the voter gets shown a ballot with fewer choices. Um, we also have to support write-in votes. So curiously in Texas, and this is, every state is different, in Texas write-in votes, candidates for election via write-in vote must register in advance. Now you might say, now wait a minute, but that's how it works. So hypothetically, I could help, the, I could have autocomplete, where I say, oh, are you trying to vote for X? In theory, I could do that. In practice, I think the politicians would scream bloody murder if I did that. But we could do it, maybe. That's, that's a very interesting question. Anyways, I'm running low on time, so I'm gonna wrap up by talking about a couple different extension possibilities. So imagine if we standardized things. We had standard data formats, standard ballot definitions, standard formats for an encrypted ballot. Then that would mean that we could ship these things all over the place. So now imagine you have an overseas or military voter. They could go into their, into their, um, into their mess hall in, in the, in the military context or into an embassy or consulate in the civilian context, and there could be a star vote machine. And they could arrange in advance for their ballot style to be delivered there. They can vote, they can generate a paper ballot and an encrypted ballot. The encrypted ballot could be shipped, you know, like copied out of these machines and then shipped both electronically or on CD or via FedEx. And likewise, the paper could be shipped via FedEx. Even if it takes a while to get, even if the paper takes a while to get there, the electronic stuff can get there quickly. So this is, this, think of this as analogous to provisional voting. We can generate ballots and ship them around quickly and we still, we still have to decide whether we should accept them, but we can do this and it's not internet voting. I'm not letting you, I'm not suggesting that I want to use StarVote as a way of voting over the internet from your personal computer full of malware and viruses and stuff, no. I'm talking about a dedicated star vote machine that happens to be in a foreign country. So I think that that's, that to me is the middle ground between remote voting bad and you know, internet voting inevitable. Well, the middle ground is you can hopefully find your local embassy or consulate or military base and we can set up a controlled environment there. I think that might be the middle ground that works. Extension number two. Let's say that you don't have all of these constraints. So you don't need to support thousands of different ballot styles at hundreds of different locations. Instead, you have one ballot style per location. Now we can imagine pre-printing ballots and marking them by hand. How are we gonna do that? Well, now we can get rid of some of the voting terminals. Now we only need voting terminals for accessibility purposes. And what does that give us? Now we, we, the, we still have, the, the, the terminals that are left, we add a scanner. So you fill out your paper ballot, it's scanned at the terminal, 
And then it prints out the regular star vote ballot summary that I already showed you. So basically, we can add a paper front end to the same star vote back end. This is the sort of thing that might work in places that can't afford to buy a lot of vote terminals, but they can afford to buy some of them. I'm not, this isn't what Travis County wants to do, but if somebody didn't have Travis County's constraints, we could rearrange this into a hand-marked paper ballot system. And of course, have all the same accessibility features. For a voter who is um, unable to hand-mark paper, no problem, we've got the computer with the touch screen and with the headphones and with all the other features that are meant to add accessibility. And oh, by the way, in a world like this, you could fill out a draft ballot at home and take it in with you and then scan that. So that could, make, that could, that could accelerate the speed. You could be in and out fast because you've already marked up the 100 candidates you want. Of course, if you want to make changes, like somebody coerces you and says, here, vote this stack, then you get into the polling place and say, actually, I need to, now, now you could scan into the voting terminal and make changes. And say, oh, I didn't, act, you know, the, 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 the dude bribing me put Alice for president. I get to the voting terminal, I scan it, and I switch from Alice to Bob and then hit print. So you could pre-mark your ballot, even if you're being coerced, and you could still change it at the end of the day and avoid the coercion. So this could potentially have some really nice efficiency benefits. I mean, I can't vote these days without bringing a cheat sheet with me because there's so many weird offices, you know, down, you know, water utility district commissioner number three. How am I supposed to remember how I want to vote for that person? Well, I do it by making a cheat sheet. It's the only way. So now I could actually scan my cheat sheet. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, how might this work in practice? As it turns out, counties already have a lot of things that they do, like record keeping. You, know, you got married, you bought a house. All of these are records that the county keeps. And the, the, your county and the adjacent county probably need to keep exactly the same kinds of records. So counties, in fact, already build do consortiums to have shared infrastructure to manage all these documents. Hey, wait a minute. Maybe counties could have shared infrastructure to write and maintain a, an open source software project. So in fact, that's not crazy. Bureaucratically, counties already know how to do this. So it's possible that this could, star vote could have evolved into the star vote consortium. You know, my, 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 my real dream for this is that we have this consortium that, that you know, counties pay money to join, and then it's, it's like, just like, you know, you, open source software is free, but there are companies that will sell you support contracts, right? So the consortium could operate like that. It's free, but hey, you want us to help, you, help your county? Pay us some money and we'll help you. And I think with a business model like that, we might be able to make this work. And that would be, so now we have vendors who do nothing but sell hardware and hardware support. And then we have a nonprofit consortium in charge of the software. This is a dream. It could happen and it could be open source. So wrapping things up, star vote, it's, this is a, it's happening. This is a, a voting machine that we're designing and working on that will have end-to-end -end verification. It'll have fancy risk-limiting audits. It'll have redundancy all over the place to, to deal with all kinds of real-world common failure modes. It'll have some very fancy usability and accessibility features, carefully designed not to impinge on the security, or rather the security doesn't impinge on the usability. Take your, take your pick. And we can use off-the-shelf hardware, which reduces cost. So star vote, it's happening. Any questions? Okay, so uh, questioners, please go to the microphones. Yes, sorry. Sorry? Two questions. Time for two questions. Okay. Go ahead. So, so at the end, so when, they're, so when they've done their voting and so they get the printout of the results. So they're walking around with the printout of the results. And if somebody goes to their shoulder and, and they're like, you're voting for who? For that guy? What's the matter with you? Right, so, so even though it may not be an integrity risk, there might still be a privacy risk. Right, that's a very real privacy risk. And that's a risk with the hand-marked paper ballots just as well today. Yeah, um, but particularly with results where you see right. specifically. And so if, if we want to have a tangible, physical, touchable artifact, which a lot of people seem to think is a good idea, and I agree with them, then how are we going to protect your privacy while you're shuttling the tangible artifact from here over to here to put it in a box? The answer 
is a privacy sleeve, which is basically a manila folder. Yeah, I mean, you're going to need something like that. So, but some people may not use it. They may just walk around because they still want a seat. Right. I mean, you could also just hold it close to your chest and walk like this. I mean, yeah. to the extent that this is a problem, the solution is to go to Office Max and buy yourself some manila folders. Okay. But it's probably, it's going to be what people do. I mean, it's not, I mean, it's all they're able, they might have to hold a certain distance in order to read it, for instance. But people may not be able to see it right up close or. Right. Uh, other questions? Yeah, please to the microphone. Okay, just, just a basic point of information I didn't quite follow. So if the person doesn't put it in the ballot box, have they voted or they haven't voted? If you don't put it in the ballot box, you have not voted. So then how do they vote? Do they so, have to go back and do it again? So if you don't put it in the ballot box, then what you have in election parlance is a spoiled ballot. But that's and, a challenge, right? Is that well, what you Right. So in traditional paper elections, there's always a process for, whoops, I made a mistake. You know, you've been, you bubbled it wrong. And the process is you go to your poll worker and you say, oops, I made a mistake. And the poll worker says, no problem. They get out the big red stamp, and they hand you another ballot. So that would work here just as well. You'd go right back to the controller, and they'd put you right back in the queue. And, and so the idea is that you use that challenge ballot, you take it home to check to see if, what, how do you check, or what do you? Yeah, so when you go through, so, this, so the, a voter gets to, in t Texas law says you get three tries. So you could pr produce two challenge ballots on purpose, but the third one, you'd better get it right and cast it. The two challenge ballots, you get to take, you get to take that thing home with you. And you also get the, that header that has the QR code and stuff, which allows you to verify. At the end of the day, they will decrypt the corresponding ciphertext on the public bulletin board. And so you can verify that it corresponds to this piece of paper that you're holding. So, so you see something in the bulletin board that says, this is a spoiled ballot or yes. something? Yes. Okay. I mean, yeah, every ballot, every single ballot is on the bulletin board. And each ballot has a flag next to it that says, I'm counted, I'm challenged, I'm counted, I'm counted, I'm challenged. So one, one last simple question. Why not, I guess you don't, you don't actually scan the votes and count them in the ballot box. Uh, why not? Well, I mean, we could. Yeah. The, the theory is that because the voting, everything is recorded on this network, so it's, we, have cop, we have lots and lots and lots of copies. Plus, we've got the copy on the paper. For the ballot box, I could make the ballot box fancier. I could put more logic in there and have it do a traditional old school tally. I don't need it. The purpose of the ballot box is to keep track of which ballots are cast and to provide auditing evidence later. That we, so we've got all this paper stuff to compare to the electronic stuff. The primary tally will be done from the electronic stuff. Okay, you could do it, but at this point you're not. Right, we could okay. do it, and in fact we're using the, you can't quite make it out at this on the screen here, but we're using the OCRA font, which makes this extra super easy for you to scan mechanically. Uh, do we have time for another one? All right, let's, let's be quick. Oh, okay, all right, I realize that, um, the scenario that you gave was just one, they had their own criterion and everything that was required, especially yep. when it came to the battery backup. And as well, when it comes to the paper ballots, they're really just for auditing purposes. But is uh, when it comes to thermal paper, do you run into any issues with like fading and things like that when they're not, you know, I, I'm wondering the time they use by the time they do recounts or whatever, the integrity of those are, is yep. kind of. Thermal paper sucks. Mm -hmm. um, it turns black at 150 Fahrenheit. And when exposed to sunlight, it'll slowly turn brown. Thermal, and you know, I, I live in Texas. I, you, you leave your gas station receipt on your dashboard, and within a couple days, it's illegible. So this is very much a pressing concern. The best I can say is that the polling places themselves are air conditioned. And if they're not, people ain't going to go there to vote. And then the ballots, you know, we just have to say, don't leave the a ballot box in the trunk of your car, please. And once again, the paper is not, it's just one of many copies. So if we lose a ballot box because somebody did something stupid, like leave a ballot box in the trunk of a car in the Texas summer, in the sun, 
Yes, that was dumb, but it's not fatal. We lost some of our auditing power, but we haven't lost the ability to tally the election. So, you know, th bad things happen, at least we can recover. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much.